I think we can start, right, Sujit? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, okay. All right, let me share my desktop then first. Okay. And can you see? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, um, oh, wait, I should also share my face, right? Okay, yeah. Okay. So, um, so today we are going to cover um, autoencoders. And this um, uh, class was, um, you know, uh, taught by Alfredo Senziani. And so he starts off with uh, applications of autoencoders, you know, also any, any kind of, you know, various generative models like GANs, right? So um, the more like outputs of autoencoders, what autoencoders and uh, related, um, you know, models can do, right? So one of them is uh, image generation, uh, where they have used uh, outputs of StyleGAN, and these are all fake faces created using features from many many faces in the training set and combining them. And one indication of this is that the background is kind of blurry, or uh, in this case, uh, uh, he claims that the background is actually uh, you know impossible, right? So I, I wasn't able to figure this out. It just looks like trees to me for the second guy. Um, but you know that's uh, he must have seen something which I'm not seeing. Um, and the next example he does is he takes a picture of a dog and a bird, and then he says, if I were to combine them in RGB space, right? So you would uh, you know see the next block, figure three, right? You would see um, you know first the dog, and then slowly the bird uh, image, uh, you know, kind of mixing with it. And uh, that's that's how you would interpolate, right? However, uh, if you look at interpolating in the space that is the output of the GANs, right, of the, the autoencoders, I think more like the latent space of the autoencoders, if you were to uh, mix them up in that space, um, in that case, the, you would see a different kind of interpolation where the dog um, you know, gradually turns into a bird, right, with all the intermediate steps, like, you know, you, you you put maybe a monkey and a human on two sides of the range, and you would see evolution happen, right? So it's kind of uh, the idea is that. So in that sense, uh, latent space is better at capturing, you know, reality or you know, some version of reality. Um, similarly, there are other examples where uh, you can take an image and zoom it. Uh, you can take an image and shift it. You know, change the brightness and so forth. And the, the idea is that it is learning. So the, your model has learned some, you know, has some understanding of reality, right? Some uh, of the physics behind uh, the, you know, it's just not, um, it's not just mixing uh, the two images, right? Pixels. And here there is uh, another application, it's called super resolution. And um, here you take a blurry image or a low res image and you convert it into high res image. And uh, so if you read through this, it says the first column is the actual input image. Um, the second one is what you would get from bicubic interpolation. This is a computer vision. You know, it's a non-learned non thing, unsupervised thing. It's just, uh, it just interpolates neighboring pixels. And the third is the output generated by a neural net and this one. And, and this is the ground truth, the last one. And it's true for all these images. And he notes that, um, you know, there is a bias towards the data uh, because this man is obviously Asian, but he looks uh, more Caucasian in this picture, right? And, okay, uh, reconstructed face of the bottom left woman. So this one, uh, I wasn't sure why it looks weird, but uh, it claims, you know, he claims it looks weird. So yeah, we we'll take it there. So um, also uh, image in painting where you occlude uh, parts of the image and have the, the network uh, fill those blanks in. And you can see that it has done a reasonably good job. Um, there's also another application where you can take a caption and create images and out of it. And that's another example of a generative uh, model. Uh, Autoencoders being one of the generative models, right? Okay. So um, then he moves on. So that is like, you know, he gives you an introduction to what autoencoders are capable of and so forth. And so uh, basically, then he goes into the actual definition of autoencoders. And essentially, autoencoders are self-supervised uh, neural networks where the objective, where the source and the target are the same. Basically, you try to teach a network to reproduce itself, right? 
Uh, so, and how it does that is uh, there are two ways of doing it. One is uh, under complete and one is over complete, which we'll get to. And so if you look at the equations here, uh, essentially, you know, your X is the input and then it goes through a bunch of uh, weights and an um, activation and it produces a hidden state H. And again, that goes through a bunch of um, weights and an activation and it produces um, the output X hat, right? And these, in, in this particular case, uh, the examples here is, basic, is basically a linear uh, layer here, but it can be arbitrarily complicated, right? Um, and so you have, so basically you can think of this as uh, your input image going through an encoder, creating a latent uh, representation, and that latent representation being decoded and to uh, recreate the input again, right? And um, so uh, from the from point of view equations, this, uh, this thing can be basically written out in this way. So you have a hidden state, which is uh, you know, a function of a, non uh, a linear layer and a, a non-linearity, and then uh, x hat is another uh, function, g, right? And that's pretty much it. Okay, so, so essentially autoencoders are things that are trained to reproduce their inputs, right? Uh, cre recreate that entity function in some way. So um, the point is that, you know, why use it? I mean, we already have the input, right? And what's the point of having to generate output? So there are two uh, basic primary applications. One of them is, um, well, I mean, uh, so again, going back to the under complete and over complete. So here he says primary applications of autoencoders are anomaly detection and image denoising. Uh, I actually, uh, I have, it's not like my project. I was actually, this was another uh, project that uh, I was part of one of the teams there. So um, what they used was uh, they took financial transactions and uh, they were trying to find fraud, right? Using autoencoders. So the idea was that uh, they calculated that uh, fraud is about 2% of the entire uh, universe of financial transactions. So they created an autoencoder to <sighs> reproduce, you know, a normal, um, transaction, right? So, and whenever, so, and they would calculate the reconstruction error, right? So they would send in that, uh, you know, that feature set uh, representing a transaction and they would see how, you know, how well it was reconstructed back using a trained autoencoder, right? And if the reconstruction error was poor, then they would conclude it was fraud and then pass it for human uh, evaluation, right? So that's one, um, so anomaly detection is basically, the, you know, the idea there. Uh, also, image denoising, where you can, and we will see that there is a denoising autoencoder where you basically, you know, mess up the image and you try to get it to uh, recreate the original image. We have also seen it with the super resolution, where you input uh, low resolution images and uh, try to get back high resolution images, um, and that's very useful for, um, you know, for microscopy, right? So you, there is a, um, yeah. So, okay. And so the idea here is that, uh, okay, so let's, let, we'll come to that when we um, go to under complete. So what he says here is that autoencoder's task is to be able to reconstruct data that lives on the manifold, right? So the, even though it's a trivial task to reproduce the input, the output from the input, um, you are really not trying to do that. You are trying to, you know, take the typical input learn the space, uh, the subspace that the typical input resides in and reproduce only that, right? So going back to the fraud detection example, your job is to, or the network's job is to reproduce, reproduce normal transactions, right? Not abnormal transactions. So that's, that's I think, what he means, that, uh, you know, uh, reconstruct only input that exists in the manifold. And uh, thus we constrain the model. Uh, okay, so exactly, so, okay. Um, and another example is image compressor. So obviously, so if you think of uh, going back to this uh, diagram, if H is much smaller than, uh, you know, this, the dimensionality of H is smaller than X or X hat, um, then you can think of it as image compression, right? So you are basically squeezing out all the, you know, the stuff that you care about in the image and which is needed for reconstructing the image. And, um, you know, so that serves as a compressing uh, uh, technique as well. Okay. And, okay. So reconstruction loss, obviously, you're I just have a question then. Yeah, go for it, yeah. Uh, could you kind of go back to the um, 
the fraud detection example that you were kind of giving? Um, this was so an said, example. It's not here. I mean, right, right. Okay. So you were saying uh, they trained it in such a way where they were able to reproduce the transactions, right, on the auto encoder. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then, so how was the? I would, so I'm kind of trying to wrap my head around at inference. How were they using that? So in inference, they would pass in. So they would train it on this huge amount of. I think it's a, like a time series of uh, transactions for a particular person or a particular mm -hmm. account. Mm -hmm. And um, then they would train the autoencoder to reproduce that time series back, right? right? And at inference time, they would take the time series of a sequence of transactions for mm -hmm. a particular party and then uh, try to see if the time series was reconstructed back to a certain, um, you know, within a certain tolerance. Interesting. Okay. Right? So you would pass it through the usually when you build out an autoencoder, you usually only use the encoder side of it, right? So in this instance, it looks like you use the encoder yes. to generate the uh, lower dimensional representation right. and then even use the decoder to kind of generate it back and then compare errors. Right, so um, you're essentially looking at the reconstruction loss. Right? I see. Right, so that's, yeah. And yeah. that was their mode of inference, which I thought was a really cool idea because yeah. Uh, it also goes back to this, uh, you know, reproducing the manifold rather than reproduce the entire uh, universe of inputs, right? So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah, cool. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, so um, okay, reconstruction loss, right? So reconstruction loss is like really simple. We know our input is the same as output, or at least that's what we expect it to be. So y and x are the same, and uh, the idea is to minimize the difference between uh, y and x, right? X and x hat in this case. And uh, for, again, there's nothing new here for uh, classification tasks. Uh, we can, or when the input is categorical, we can use the cross entropy loss and as the loss function. And when the input is real valued, we can use uh, mean squared error, right? So again, you know, the, the point of this is uh, there is nothing new here. It's only the inputs and the outputs, which uh, are uh, kind of different here. Okay. So, and then we come to this uh, famous under complete and over complete. So when, under, when we say an autoencoder is undercomplete, the hidden layer, the dimension to the hidden layer is uh, smaller than that of the input or output. And uh, when it's overcomplete, the dimensionality of the hidden layer is larger than um, the input and the output, right? So if we remember simultaneous equations, right? Um, if your uh, hidden layer is actually larger or equal to your input, then it's trivial to basically create an identity function, right? So uh, we will see what's going on with this overcomplete. The undercomplete is fairly easy to understand, obviously, because you're squeezing uh, the space, right? You're squeezing out uh, basically the features that you really care about, the latent features. And then, um, you know, the, or the model is during training. And at the end of it, you can actually use this, um, you know, the encoder side, uh, which uh, um, you just pointed out, right? Um, the encoder side to create, um, you know, latent representations of your input, right? And uh, yeah, so that that's uh, easier to think about. I mean, uh, but in in terms of uh, the overcomplete, the way they get around uh, this, you know, the trivial identity function uh, issue is by adding noise to the input and having the network learn how to get rid of the noise, right? And so that's. Here, so okay, reconstruct the input, copying all the input features. Okay, I think that's that's all it is. Okay, so then uh, he goes and talks about the denoising autoencoder. So again, imagine that this line is a manifold that we are trying to learn, and uh, your um, you know points live along this manifold um, in your input, obviously, and then what you do is you try to you know, perturb the points in the manifold, essentially adding noise. And then you ask um, the model to learn how to, you know, uh, reconstruct the input, right? So the idea is that, um, you know, we, we talked about this last week, uh, where you, you know, perturb the input, and then what happens is that uh, it uh, pushes the energy of uh, these outputs, I think, uh, this one was uh, pushing down, right? Denoising. 
So it pushes down the energy on the manifold. So you create this like deep uh, gully kind of thing, right? A ravine kind of thing. And things just drop down back. And um, so it says we assume injecting the same noisy distribution we observe in reality. So we can learn how to robustly recover from it. And here is, uh, you know, so you have these points on a um, spiral manifold and you add noise and you see after uh, training, it reproduces uh, these noise back, you know, and uh, puts it back on the spiral. So that's, it's two of these. And then he talks about the contractive autoencoder, which is really just a denoising autoencoder with a regularization, L2 regularization attached. And um, so, Essentially, what is happening is uh, not only is um, you know it's the the I, I think it's you can think of it as the shape of the gully, right? Uh, the the raven that is formed around the manifold. So because you have this um, quadratic uh, regularization loss, L two regularization, the shape of your gully is you know it's like a, um, a parabola, right? Along so here is your manifold and here is your uh, energy uh, landscape. And you know, so essentially, uh, the further you, uh, so it's not it's not linear, right? So the further you get away, the steeper the curve is, right? To, and so it uh, makes it more um, uh, efficient as uh, to reconstruct the input, right? Okay. So um, then we come to the notebook, and I'm going to just uh, make this bigger. What is the edge in that equation? Uh, where? Uh, with the regularization term there? Uh, H, I think, is the, um, here, the norm of the gradient of the, so this is the H is the hidden representation. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, okay. and this is the norm of the gradient, so yeah, it's just squared. Okay. okay. And so um, I'm going to just do this. Right. So here's the notebook. There's a single notebook today. I mean, it's not uh, much. Uh, what I did was uh, the original notebook. Um, they are basically, you know, creating all kinds of uh, two kinds of versions: the regular autoencoder and uh, the denoising one. Uh, I kind of rolled it out for convenience and so that I don't have to train it while we are talking. Uh, so these are the normal imports. Uh, here, these are two uh, functions that we'll come back to. This one basically takes uh, the vector, um, you know, the flattened image vector and creates an image out of it. And it's true for um, the weight vectors as well. Um, and then um, this is a displaying routine, which we'll also see later on. Um, it basically, uh, it takes input and output and it takes the number of inputs and outputs you want. And it creates a line of uh, inputs and it creates a line of outputs, right? So, but, you know, we will see it in action later. So, here, this is uh, basically just taking the MNIST data set and uh, putting in uh, two transforms on it. Uh, one is just creating you know, image to tensor and the, one, the second one is uh, normalizer. So essentially um, what this does is it takes, uh, you know, it subtracts 0.5 from each pixel and it divides the result by 0.5. So this is all your, uh, the set of means and set of standard deviations. And so essentially it's like a normalization step, right? So, what you're doing here is you're taking uh, the MNIST data set, you're putting it through these transforms that we just talked about, and you download through. Okay, so, and you create a data loader out of it, which we will use later. And here we do the device thing where, you know, look for CUDA and you set it accordingly. So the first one is the autoencoder. Um, again, um, it's not very difficult to read here. It's uh, just one sequential um, layer followed by a 10H nonlinearity. Decoder is the same. The only difference is that the input is 28 by 28 and it uh, encodes to a size of D where D is 30. And uh, the decoder is, uh, it out, you know, takes an input of size um, 30 and outputs to a size 28 by 28. And you basically forward it, you know, X to encoder. Then, you know, it is. So this is like really simple, right? And you choose here, the criterion is uh, mean squared loss. And we have uh, Adam optimizer with the learning rate and so forth. So the training loop here, uh, what it does is basically takes in your data um, and you know, uh, passes your, so the forward uh, piece is like you take your model and you pass the image into it. 
the image is basically flattened out here, right? So it's just a long vector of 28 by 28. And then you calculate the loss using MSC and, uh, you know, zero grad backward step. And then you display the images, right? So, and you do this for 20 epochs. And here is the output of the 20 epochs. So the, the way to read this is that, you know, these are the images that is formed at the end of each epoch, right? So he takes uh, four, um, so we set n equals four here, I think in the defaults, right? Or n equals one, sorry. So I think he puts it here then. It doesn't, okay, for some, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, so n, n I think is the number of, uh, n is not none, range four. So. Uh, oh, it does it for n times. Okay, so um, so in that case, okay, so that will be each how many rows are formed at you know at each call, right? So here at each epoch, you form one row of four images, and at the end of uh, the first uh, epoch, you see it's all blurry, and as you go down the uh, you know the epochs, it gets better and better and better, and at the end of twenty epochs it looks almost you know readable right and he does the same thing with the encoder kernels and uh, you know these again you can see that some of them have learned uh, some kind of shapes very vague shapes almost like filters right so you can uh, think of these weights as being um, multiplied with your input and uh, you know kind of showing these guys up right so you know enhancing uh, these images and again, these are um, weights at each stage, I think. No, sorry. So these are weights at encoder zero, weight five. Why are they display images? Oh, so um, this is basically doing like five uh, different uh, weights. I think he takes at uh, random, I think. So model encoder zero is uh, basically the, the linear weight that we have, right? And then he takes five. I don't actually know why he does five here. So these are the outputs and essentially these are the weights here. And this yeah. one, uh, yeah, go I have for a question. It. Yeah. So, so um, these, are, these activation maps are, how are they constructed? I mean, the, the weights aren't the same size as the images, right? So are they just taking the weights and putting them into a square matrix? Yes, I think so. Yeah. I if see. you look at the display image here, I think that's what it does. So data actually it doesn't tell you that, right? I mean, I am sure. So he is basically in pick. I think it is a square matrix. Um, the I am sure may be doing this by itself. He's using the two image method that he that he the two image method that he defines above ah, there, but okay. that but that sure. makes it into a twenty eight by twenty eight. So <clears throat> I'm not, but I'm not sure that the, that that's the right dimension. I mean, at least because um, the encoding layer is uh, a different size than the than seven hundred and eighty four. Right. Yeah, I think it squeezes it down to twenty eight by twenty eight. We should look at the view. You know, maybe. PyTorch view has some hidden thing that he's talking about. Right? Ah, I see. I think so. The uh, first uh, example that you've trained on here, the uh, 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 hidden um, units in the intermediate um, layer is taken as 30 uh, for the standard auto encoder. Yes. So it's Sorry, can, can you say that again? Uh, the, the hidden layer is what? The uh, the uh, 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 hidden layer, the uh, 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 dimension of the uh, hidden layer is taken as 30 here, I suppose. Yes. If so, oh, I'm not, yeah. uh, weights would be, uh, you know, 20, 764 times 30, right? Because that's how you would, you know, so input is 764 and output is 30. So the weights would be 764 by 30, right? So yeah, the uh, yeah, the, then the linear layer will be 784, 30. Uh, yes, the okay, 784. Encoders, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So you're reshaping uh, each row on that, right? And that's what the activation map you're looking at. Are we reshaping each row? Yeah. 
wait, let's see. Maybe you're right. Yeah. Okay, so this one, right? So model encoder zero dot wait. No, it's not actually doing it each row. It's doing five rows of these and, you know, Yeah, I'm not sure. We have to look at the views, I think, here. Good point, though. I mean, I, I actually didn't think of this. Yeah. P. View shares with his base. Same underlying data. Slicing and element wise. It doesn't talk about reshaping it though. Huh. Yeah, I'm not I'm not really sure of this, but the view view is taken here as the size zero and minus one. So I think so. This will have the representation of the above. Uh, that's 784 cross uh, E, which will be here yeah, 30 for the first step. But yeah, uh, for the uh, let us try to. Uh, because uh, I'm running on the second version. Yes. What would model dot encoder zero return? Model dot encoder zero returns uh, tan h. Uh, oh well, uh, encoder zero, right? Is this one? So it takes um, seven eighty four and um, outputs like thirty. Encoder zero. Um, Sujit, do you have the notebook open in your? Are you actually running the notebook? Yes. Maybe we could look at model dot encoder um, and see what it okay. verify yeah. what it looks like. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, we can. I can start it up. All right, so here's the model. Um, okay, let's do this. And then I can just add something here. Model encoder. Yeah, so in features, so that's, that's what model encoder is. And so we can do weights, size, no? Linear attribute has no weights, right? It's just, it's just weight. Weight, maybe, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so 30 by 784 is the, the, you know, that's what it's trying to do. So, okay, actually let's go one step further. So we said display images, model encoder zero weight, right? So maybe we try, so what does it do here? Uh, uh, display images, right? So display images goes and does, I am show outpick i4. Okay. So let's do display images and you know we can none model encoder zero eight. And we don't have to do anything here. Okay, what do we get? So we get just four. So if we get four, uh and then he says, so four is basically this bit, right? So he says two image out.cpu.data. So, okay. So let's see what out, so, okay. Let's see what the data looks like here. Um, so model encoder. 
zero, wait, is your out. And if I look at data, did I already put it in? Okay, so I said CPU then. Although it shouldn't matter in my case. So I was, yeah. What did I, oh, sorry, okay. Also 3784, which, you know, kind of makes sense, right? So, so I guess that's what Mike said is that there's 30 rows and each row has the 784. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're looking at the, the um, there's 30 different maps and we're looking at the first four. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. And these are 784. Yeah. Right. Okay. That, that makes sense. So that's, that's what Mike said. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Yeah. That totally makes sense. Okay. All right. So, okay. So this is good. Uh, that thing uh, we understood at least. Yeah. This is nice. Thank you. Um, so these are like, you know, you can see these vague shapes and uh, obviously this, this filter has learned nothing, right? Uh, and neither has this one. Um, so that's the output of the autoencoder. So denoising autoencoder, uh, I, instead of uh, modifying in place, I created my own uh, little thing where uh, I basically do the, do the exact same things as um, Alfredo does on uh, the, uh, during the lecture. And uh, so instead of uh, D equals 30, I say D equals 500. One point that uh, he makes here is that, you know, 500 is still less than 784. Uh, and so, you know, in, if you think very uh, rationally, um, it's still under complete, right? The input is 784 output, the, the hidden is 500. However, he makes a point that uh, because these are really sparse, so as a, because it's a number, right? So you have these 784 pixels and only a few of them are on. Right, because of you know the way handwriting is, and uh, therefore D in this case um, is overcomplete. Right, so that's that's the thing he talks about. Yeah, I appreciated that point that he made because the possible number of images is 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 much less than the than yes. the total possible combination of the pixels. Yes. But what I don't understand is where's the dividing line? I mean, how can you say when you have an overcomplete versus undercomplete? Um, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's okay. left that's left up in the air. But I do understand what he's saying is that yeah. even 500 could be over complete. Yeah, exactly. Right. Isn't that going to be always true in the cases of images? Uh, not in all, uh, not for continuous images, though I don't think, right? Because this is handwriting and it's kind of, you know, most pixels are off and some are on. Whereas in, in a real image, most pixels are on to some degree yeah, or other. Yeah, but, but I think that to Rekhil's point is that, um, what does he call it? He says that images are, comp is, is it compositional that he talks about? That is that they're always composed of smaller units that are connected, that are uh, d discrete parts. And so even if you took at the, look at the total space of all possible images, um, th th sorry, the total space of all possible 28 by 28 um, pixel images, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the ones that will actually correspond to images that are actually taken by cameras in nature is a much smaller space. True, yeah, yeah. But although, I mean, there is, uh, so this is pre-neural networks. Um, yeah. So, you know, uh, if you think of uh, say cartoons or uh, figures in scientific literature, like charts and graphs, right? versus wow. uh, images, they actually have uh, very different characteristics, right? If you take their gradient or if you take the histogram of the gradients, you will find that uh, uh, for, you know, these black and white cartoonish kind of things or figures, right? Um, you would find like a big spike at uh, zero and a big spike at one because most right. of the, you know, is concentrated. Right, there. right. but even so, if you, if you take, um, if you generate a random, you know, 28 by 28, um, uh, matrix mm -hmm. um it it will most most configure most if you start doing random number generate a random generation of 20 by 20 pixels by far the most of them would never correspond to yes. any image from any domain you know mm -hmm. so so i think to Reckel's point the thing the fact that something is an image that is what what somebody would recognize as a photograph or a graphic or some visual display of information um, is a much smaller space than the than all the possible configurations true. of a twenty eight by twenty. That that is true too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I can see that, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so again, uh, so denoising autoencoder, uh, there is not much difference uh, structure wise. Um, 
except that uh, D here is much higher, right? Uh, compared to the previous one. And everything else being the same. Uh, so now here, instead of, uh, you know, passing in the image directly, um, you pass in the a noisy image. And the way he's done it is actually quite cool, I thought. Um, so he creates this dropout layer and default uh, probability of dropout is 0.5 in this case, right? And so essentially you have, you know, when you multiply this, uh, this dropout, right? So essentially what he's doing here is takes the torch once and he takes the image shape. So he creates a 28 by 28 matrix of binaries like zero and one, right? With a probability of 0.5 of them turned off, right? Half of them turned off. And, uh, you know, and then he multiplies it by the image. So, yeah, and that, that, therefore he creates a noisy image, right? And uh, then he does the forward here, you know, uh, calculates the loss and, you know, does the usual dance here. And so, and here he, the display image is a little different. He says, here is my uh, bad image, my noisy image input, and here is my output, right? And these are on consecutive uh, rows. This is the first epoch, these two. And, uh, you know, again, uh, second epoch and third epoch and so on. And as you can see, as it progresses down to 20 epochs, it gets better and better. Um, however, the important point to note here is that it gets significantly better compared to the, the standard autoencoder, right? So even though the input is actually corrupted, um, it's able to reconstruct, uh, you know, decent images at the end, okay? And uh, we do the exact same thing with the display images here. And, uh, you know, as you can see here, this has also learned uh, some filters. Some of them haven't like this. Um, however, the one major difference is that the energy landscape outside the image, right? This is like really smooth and you can see it all over, uh, you know, in all, all the cases where it has learned something that the, it's remarkably smooth, right? Uh, compared to the energy landscape here. Ooh. Okay. So here you can see that, you know, outside is kind of spiky, right? So there are peaks and valleys even outside. So it can, you know, so, so in that sense, the denoising autoencoder is uh, more efficient at uh, reconstructing because, you know, it has efficiently, you know, effectively eliminated the edges of your, um, yeah, at least that's, uh, you know, kind of what I got. And then he compares it with uh, OpenCV models. Um, and uh, he's taking two of them. One is uh, this inpaint NS and inpaint Telia. And uh, he does the exact same thing here. He creates, uh, let's see what these are. So display image is noise, image bad. So, so this is the, so this is the noise template that he creates. He adds it to the image here and creates this uh, noisy image. And here is the output that he produces, right? I wish you would have done it a little differently so we could you know, see it uh, kind of contiguously. Oh. And this is, these four are, um, wait, sorry. with torch no grad. So, okay, so he does uh, three to seven. Oh, okay, so he does, uh, Image bad three to seven. So is it only four of them or more? Wait. So noise and image bad are the first two. And then the input image and the output image are the next. Ah, okay. So this is the input and output of the autoencoder. And then here is the input and output of these uh, OpenCV, uh, you know, non neural network uh, methods that are, you know, canned ones. So uh, as you can see, the neural network. Uh, has outperformed the you know uh, the OpenCV methods here. So that's that's here. I also did the contractive autoencoder um, just for um, you know. So since I figured it was just the same thing with a loss function, you know, the, the loss function regularized. So initially I tried using the standard trick with you know adding a weight decay to the optimizer. Uh, that didn't work out so well for me. So then I did it, um, you know, I basically did it manually here. So here I'm, you know, the loss is being calculated and then I calculate my regularization loss. So essentially what I'm doing here is um, I'm creating a tensor of zeros, like an accumulator. And then I'm looping through the model 
and taking each of its weights, I'm uh, basically adding, uh, you know, I'm calculating the loss, uh, the norm, the, the second norm, and, uh, you know, adding this uh, regularization loss multiplied by uh, lambda factor, right, uh, which is 1e minus 5 in my case. Uh, and, you know, I'm just adding to the loss here and uh, doing the same optimizer thing, right? And so here again, uh, the output is similar to the denoising one. Here is the noisy input and here is the output, first epoch. And then we go down all the way. And okay, here. So here is the, you know, uh, at the 20th epoch, uh, it's better than the first epoch. And that's pretty much it. I also did the, you know, the, the maps, weight maps, I don't know, kernel maps, yeah. And um, uh, they, they look kind of similar to the denoising order encoder. But yeah, I thought this was interesting in the sense that, you know, the I didn't actually know how to do this manually. Um, I knew about the weight decay trick, uh, but, you know, so I learned something here. So I'm sharing. So, and that's, that's pretty much all I had. And oh, in, the, in the lecture, I remember that, um, what's that fellow's name? Um, uh, yeah, the- Alfredo? Alfredo, yeah, Alfredo said that he uh, couldn't implement L1, L1 regularization, but I would imagine that what you did, all you'd have to do is um, slip in L1, the L1 regularization instead of the L2 regularization. And, and you could try it and see how it works. Maybe, you know, maybe what he meant was that it, uh, sorry, uh, that uh, he couldn't get it to, you know, behave well. You know? Yeah, I, 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 he said that Jan, Jan had told him that, you know, L1 regularization works in this case or something like that. And then he tried to implement it, but couldn't or something, didn't know how to do it. Yeah, I, I doubt if he didn't know this, uh, you know, how to do it, like, you know, the 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 mechanics of it, but I, I suspect yeah. he didn't get good results. Yeah, so he didn't. He wasn't clear about actually what he had tried or what he was trying to do. So I'm not right. sure, I'm not sure, even sure if it was the same as what you just did there, but right. yeah. we we could try though. I mean, it's uh, mm. you know I think it's we have time and you know so. it doesn't take that long to uh, do, so maybe I can just do this bit, mm -hmm. and instead of two, I can just do one. So that would be my L. While that trains, um, so with the denoising encoder, we actually come in and make two changes, right? We add the noise and we tell, okay, train and give me back the image. But at the same time, we increase the dimensions from like 30 to 500. Yes. Um, so is that just that you kind of increasing the expressivity of the network so that because it has a much more harder task per se right now to kind of reconstruct from corrupted images that we are increasing the latent space representation. Um, I, I think kind of... like if you have, uh, you know, if you were to use uh, the standard approach, right, the standard autoencoder approach with a larger uh, hidden layer, uh, the task becomes trivial, right? So, you know, because essentially if you think of, you know, if you think of a set of simultaneous equations, right? So if you have two unknowns and two equations, you are able to calculate the values, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and here you just flip to um, calculating the coefficients instead. But uh, so the idea is that, you know, the, the larger hidden layer is uh, saying that, you know, I have uh, two unknowns and maybe three uh, equations mm -hmm. satisfying that unknowns, right? So um, I'm able to, you know, actually find multiple ones, but, you know, at least one I can find without any uh, learning at all. Right, so essentially you make the task harder um, so that, you know, you take away that advantage, but at the same time, you have the larger um, space uh, to make it more expressive, right? So it is able to do the optimization better, you know, separate out things better. Mm. So that is that is my intuition. I mean, I may be not uh, totally correct. So in, in, 
in a sense that it follows the pattern that we've all been shown that, you know, you go to, you put the problem in a, in a higher dimensional space, you overfit, and then you follow by some kind of regularization. And that's, that's you know, in other words, like you said, the, the higher dimensional space is more expressive, allows the model to fit better, but then you hit the model with regular, with uh, some kind of noise, or some kind of regularization, you, you shake it up and then it does a better job. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, that's, a, that's actually a very good point. I mean, the, you know, noise is regularization basically here. Yeah. yeah. And this is what Jeremy, uh, you know, always said too, is that don't be afraid to overfit, you know, because we have the, we have the tools of, of regularization to, uh, to control that after we do that. So he, he always says is that the first thing you do, and I think it's more than him, it's other people say this too. The first thing you want to do is overfit the model as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Then you introduce regularization to tamp it down, to tamp down the overfitting. Yeah, things appear really slow when you're watching it though. <laughs> In the first function where you have two image, it does some normalizing there also, right? Isn't there some minus 0.5 right at the very first function? Oh, the two image, okay. Um, 0.5, yeah, actually. I think this might be for 0.5 x plus one. If it's zero to 256, why is it? Yeah, I wonder why this is. Oh, or, the, or is this unnormalizing rather than normalizing? The denormalizing because there, the oh. normalize is using 0. 0.5 and 0. 0.5, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it's it's bringing it back to the one uh, zero to one. Oh, to display it. Okay, okay, okay. okay. That makes sense. Yeah. All right. Let's go back and see how far it's gone. My CPUs are still pegged. Probably not done yet. Yeah. Okay. Point zero nine. Seven. Sorry if I'm giving everybody a headache scrolling through. 0 0.07 to points. So this does seem to have a, you know, compared to the denoising autoencoder and the plain one, uh, it starts higher. And it says 0 0.07 to point 0.4, 0 0.04. Maybe see how it 
looks like on the So this starts off higher, 0 0.09, although you know that doesn't mean much. But we'll see how how the uh, you know the loss landscape is. This was another thing I uh, kind of picked up from uh, this Leslie Smith's uh, papers that uh, the steeper your fall is, the loss, um, the better. Um, you know, the better you learn, basically, right? Your your model is more capable of learning. It's another, you know, heuristic slash old wife steals. What's the intuition like behind that? The steeper you fall, the better the model is learning. Um, not sure. I mean, he basically made that statement without, uh, you know, he showed some graphs and basically said like, you know, these models ended up being better, and here is the loss function, and uh, you know, better in terms of final uh, performance, mm -hmm. and the fact that you know the ones that are that learn flat, um, you know or take more training cycles to learn the same thing, end up also performing uh, not as well. Oh, right? okay. so, so you're saying you basically start at the same point, end at the same point, but one is taking more steps, whereas one is jumping. Oh, yes. Interesting. Sorry, what value have you got set for your L2 regula regularization lambda value? 1e e minus 5. 1e e yeah. minus 5. Almost there. So it does finish, I mean, and uh, it's actually started higher, uh, ended higher too. But yeah, but that that's uh, you know possible because we are adding additional you know this additional yeah, uh, yeah. loss, right? So loss is higher in general, right? So and and you know going down uh, it seems to be doing about the same at least i cannot make out too much difference qualitatively uh, between the two you know, you know let's do the uh, kind of a if that, yeah. terrible metric also right it means quite a loss for images yes that, that is usually true. perceptive changes yeah, it's going to be pretty bad to kind of notice things right. <laughs> and here is the you know, the saliency maps, I think, yeah. Which look a little different, I mean, compared to the previous one. There is slightly more spiky, um, you know, the, the neighborhood outside uh, edge of the image. Mm, the um, 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 background is not uh, 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 cleaned out as well as yes. uh, it, it was earlier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's... Uh, which one is it? Is it L2 or L1 that kind of helps killing features out? 
L1, uh, well, L2 does a better job, it looks like, right? At least based no, I mean, on like, sure, When we talk about one of them. It's, it's L1. Okay. L1 is the one that uh, reduces dimensionality. Oh, okay. So then, should, I mean, in theory, like if we were to go based off that, then this should have a smoother background, right? I'm yeah. just kind of spitballing here. I'm trying to understand that. That was a very nice, interesting point that how the background is much more smoother in that one. I'm trying to still understand why that is compared to like the first auto encoder that we saw. I no, still don't understand like why there is so much spikiness there, whereas in the, uh, the denoising one is so much, has her, after adding noise, it's right, right, kind yeah. of counter intuitive there. Yeah, I don't have a good answer, but okay. I think so, the, uh, since the, uh, in the uh, 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 denoising part, the, uh, the images are kind of like uh, perturbed uh, or uh, the, uh, um, when the uh, uh, image is fed into the output model, uh, when it's passed to the forward, it's already has a kind of a, a, a dropout with the 0.5 uh, that's being applied. Here, I think so, uh, with using L1, uh, uh, it, it kind of averages out. Um, so uh, there's, uh, uh, there's uh, uh, some more. Uh, uh, neurons that are affected here, and that kind of um, results in uh, uh, those uh, values at that uh, uh, um, um, background uh, to have some kind of a uh, um, um, variation that's not uh, unregularized by. Uh, versus just adding uh, 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 regularization uh, with uh, sorry uh, dropout that that might be one one reason yeah, yeah possibly yeah one other thing I was thinking is that you know while uh, Mike was saying it actually triggered something um, so if you think about the the shape of uh, you know the L two uh, lost landscape right it's kind of a bowl right it's a quadratic. Similarly, for you know, the, on the maximum, it's an inverted bowl, right? Whereas uh, with L1, it's like a peak for up and you know, like a V for uh, bottom, right? Linear is flat. So in that sense, the the peaks that we see on the edges, right? Um, in in case of uh, L2, they're kind of rounded, right? So they appear smoother. Whereas these, there is small peaks here because of the L1, um, the shape of the regularization, right? So that is, you know, could be a possibility why we see these here, but not so many on the other. I was just wondering like, is like the difference in the loss and since you're using MSE, is that kind of contributing like to the smoothness? Like maybe if this also finally hit 0 0.04 at a comparable loss, then would the maps be kind of different? Like, yeah, yeah. possible. Yeah. yeah, I think that's all I had. Uh, oh, sorry. What did I do? Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, I'm still getting used to the new keystrokes I added. Yeah, so that's that's pretty much all I had. Um, I think yeah, he goes on with the same ideas here, uh, where a dropout mask is applied to each image. So every kernel that learns a pattern sets the pixels outside the region where the number exists some constant value. So again, this is what we observed, right? So it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. 
one more question about uh, so we train the denoising autoencoder mm -hmm. and uh, if you use just the decoder feed it in the representation of the digit it kind of denoises it and produces the output we saw the results there mm -hmm. Does, would the results change if we uh, pass it in like a non noisified like the original MNIST stuff a representation of that I, ideally, I think it should uh, reproduce it exactly, because if you notice uh, in the you know earlier uh, parts of the lecture, where he talked about these uh, you know, if you think of this as the analog right of the image in painting kind of deal, mm -hmm. where um, you know the the model is trained to recognize this entire image as being right, so you know the energy manifold, right, um, and so if you pass in. Uh, you know, a denoised version of the image, it recognizes uh, the image as being on the manifold itself. And so therefore it doesn't need to do any, uh, you know, uh, movements, right? It doesn't yeah. need to move it down. So, so you can imagine kind of this bit here, right? So if your image is already here, then uh, there is no effort required by the, the decoder uh, to move these guys back to the manifold, mm -hmm. right? So it'll just pass it through. Mm. And again, um, going back to my um, example with the um, the fraud detection, right? If you pass in a legit transaction, uh, it reconstructs it exactly. So in the same in the same way, right? I mean, if you pass in a, a denoised um, image, it should just reconstruct it exactly. Hmm. Isn't there like a slight difference though? Like there you have trained your autoencoder on legit. Yes, that, that is true. Yes. Right. Yeah. So here the manifold actually is based on what your desired output is, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. I think, uh, yeah, so this is uh, all I had. And if we, if we are good with uh, no more questions, we can you know, give everybody um, 30 minutes of their life back. Thanks, Sujit, um, for wanting. I yeah, actually had, a <laughs> um, if we could review the difference mm -hmm. between the uh, denoising autoencoder, which I think I understand, and the contractive autoencoder, which I'm not sure about. Mm -hmm. um, okay. What's the what's the main difference there? I think the main difference is the addition of the regularizer here, and so essentially what it does is it that uh, you know the way in which so if you uh, think about the perturbations, right? So the the ability to handle perturbations is uh, done by creating some kind of manifold in the latent space, right? So which encourages things to drop down into that manifold, right? And here you are, um, you know, controlling the shape of the, you know, the, the landscape that you have created, right? So um, in that sense that if you have a, a two norm, right? Uh, it's kind of a quadratic, right? Along, along this uh, manifold. So anything that goes away, right? So the further it goes away, the steeper it falls, right? I, I think of it in that term. So uh, that's basically all I could find. This, this uh, diagram, um, I wasn't able to fully understand. Uh, you know, they have this three-dimensional thing here and it looks like this spiral is the manifold, right? And I'm not really sure what he means by the Z uh, being an element of, you know, okay, I mean, I guess this is latent space. So he's talking about some kind of linear latent space here. So, yeah. Yeah, that's the point. So Z is in some sense generating that spiral curve, I, I think. Um, oh, uh, uh, this, no, okay. So this is on the decoder side, you're saying. 
um this is a kind of auto encoder in which from the uh, spiral that's the manifold we are trying to uh, construct uh, z that's the um, okay. latent space so uh, x1 x2 x3 are the uh, kind of you can say the uh, um, supervised samples mm-hmm. and uh, uh, we are trying to construct z yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, that makes sense. So maybe maybe figure nineteen is actually not connected to contractive autoencoder. I was thinking maybe you know there is some connection. There's a basic difference. I found a set of slides. I will share it in the. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I can stop sharing. As uh, uh, alluded to, uh, this this these are some uh, slides that I found. Uh, these are with respect to the overcomplete hidden layers, uh, the number of hidden layers, and how will that uh, affect the weights? And the over parameterization and the un- under parameterization as aspects as we have discussed earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, uh, the alternative ap- approach is to add an explicit term of the loss that penalizes this uh, uh, solution. And yeah, this is uh, the same as uh, 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 Sujit just talked about, in which the uh, Jacobian of an in- encoder, the uh, uh, norm is being added here, the L2 norm of uh, uh, this uh, gradient multiplied by the H, which was uh, the hidden uh, state uh, representation, and uh, for the cross ent- entropy and this this guy, that's the same. And yeah, this is the new loss loss function that we op- obtained, and yeah. uh, this is the illustration. Uh, we uh, suppose this is the uh, label here too. Uh, these are multiple labels in which uh, they try to construct uh, encoder. Let me try to zoom in. That must be sensitive to this uh, variation of uh, reconstruction, uh, since uh, as we talked about earlier. This encoder doesn't need to be sensitive to this um, uh, variation, since uh, this is not a kind of perturbation or uh, the training uh, samples that we experience from. This must only be sensitive to this uh, variation of the reconstruction. That's what we are trying to add uh, with the L2 norm here. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, so this this is the uh, whole thing. Uh, the ad- advantages are it only requires adding one or two lines. Uh, only to compute uh, compute the Jacobian of the hidden layer, and the gradient is um, deterministic and can be used in the second order optimizers with conjugate gradients and LPFGS. This this kind of loss. Uh, yeah. This was a paper. Stop the share now. So in that case, I wonder if I'm doing it wrong here, uh, because uh, I'm I'm using the L2 regularization across all the weights, right? Here he is talking only of the encoder weights, HX. So yes. maybe I should uh, you know fix this, right? So uh, only consider the ones that are in the on the encoder side. Mm-hmm. He says in this slides in this set of slides, he says that the the weights are tied. That is, the weights on the decoder side are the transpose of the weights on the encoder side. Is that how um, Alfredo implements it as well? I don't think so. Not, not here. Uh, not in the code, at least. They are not tied. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, uh, I just opened up the research paper. Uh, the noise encoders. 
the prints, robustness of small penetration of the They say that the on uh, relationship with the weight decay here is the square root of uh, L L two norm here. Uh, in the case of linear, mm -hmm. as we have just used, uh, the relationship to denoising here. Are you sharing something? <laughs> Let me try to. That's the same paper that he talked about. Uh, Sala. Ah, okay. Yeah. So I was just looking at the equations here that uh, uh, that if we have implemented the same. Uh, this maps this this guy here. This and this guy. This is the pop entropy. No, oh, this is nice. I mean, he makes it. Mm -hmm. In the uh, relationship between how to extract uh, robust features from a regularized auto encoder, this is the weight decay example. Uh, optimized. Uh, and then this is about talking about the denoising. Yeah, I think he's only look, uh, look at equation seven. So you'll see this is the Jacobian of F, right? Mm -hmm. Not G. Mm. So, you know, so my, my implementation is wrong, I think. Uh, I need to only look at the encoder side. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the uh, 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 Robinius norm, I suppose, F here, the yeah. standard problem. Yeah. Uh, oh, no. Um, the small f? Uh, small f is, I think, the function f. Um, right? So. Frobenius norm is just the two norms. So, you know, with a norm squared, that's pretty much. But here, the, I think so the F here uh, denotes the Frobenius uh, aspect of it. Yeah, okay. Because the function f there, it's you know, written as a composition of g and f. Right. So uh, g is the decoder, f is the encoder. Oh yes, 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 yes. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, that that makes sense. Uh, there. Are, oh, I was confused between the small f and the big right. Yeah. Okay. I see. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. yeah. Do we have more questions or shall we call today? Yep. 
Okay. Yep. Thanks, Sujit, for taking yeah. us for this. Sure. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. Right. Thanks, Sujit. All right. You're welcome. All right. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Thanks. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.